There was a frog that wanted to cross the lake, but he did not have the wherewithal uh, to do it and to go that distance. So he figured out that in order to get across the lake, he came up with a brilliant idea. And the idea were two birds nearby that he talked to, and he talked these two birds into picking up a twig. It was a solid twig, and and uh, he told them, if you'll both hold it in your mouth while I, while I grab it and hold on. And the birds thought for a moment, they thought that was a brilliant plan to for us to hold the twig in our mouths and for him to grab it with his mouth. And so the fr- frog latched on t- with his mouth and onto the twig and the birds lifted up and off they flew. As they were ascending, there was a man in the vicinity who saw this unusual sight of two birds carrying a frog. And through the air he asked out loud, Whoa, who came up with that brilliant idea? Then the frog said, I, and then you might know the rest of the story. Opening your mouth at the wrong time in the wrong way can do you great harm. No one has given me greater problems in my Christianity than myself. And I say that with a lot of seriousness because I am, I haven't arrived It's nice to see everyone get along once in a while and and to respect respect one another and treat one another outwardly with some regards to their welfare. But I'm still faced with the fact that I got to make my own personal decisions. Uh, Nobody can live my life for me. Uh, I face the responsibility of how I think, how I speak, and how I act, and so do you. The psalmist here in our account before us seems to be in a jam. Not with anyone in particular, he mentions, but with himself. In the previous chapter, we read about the abuse that he faced from violent men that hurled at him their poisonous statements. And in the next chapter, the psalmist makes reference that no one cared for his soul. Sandwiched between these two passages is chapter 141, it's possible that sometimes the reality of life influences you that you become aware that you are on the verge of becoming like those who set up traps and treat you as the psalmist was treated. So what does he do? I would say in a simple way, he draws near to God. And as we have watched his life, he goes to the Lord in prayer. And and someone stated that true prayer should be a way of life, not a case just for an emergency. And so tonight, as we look at the psalm, I would pray that the Lord will use it to be a help to, to you and to me. At the beginning of this chapter, we see some things that are somewhat repetitious as we study the Psalms, and I don't want to take anything for granted, so I have three thoughts I want to share with you in the in the few moments ahead, and before we go any further, let's ask the Lord's help. We're glad you're here this evening, and we welcome our friends online. Pray the Lord's will be done. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Pray you use it once again to encourage us, to speak to us, to challenge us. Lord, as we think about what the psalmist is concerned about from the previous chapter, how he mentioned what the violent man would say to him, now it seems as though he's concerned about what comes out of his own mouth, what he would say. I pray that you will help us now, and I pray for anyone who is, doesn't know you as Savior, that you will draw them to yourself, and may you have your way. Give us understanding. We pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. First of all, I see the urgency for God to listen to his petition. This is brought out in the first two verses here. Notice he says, Lord, I cried unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. In the psalmist's life, he was at the mercy of God 
And when you pray, especially, you want to have the assurance that the Lord is listening, right? There are many people tonight in the world of religion that think all their prayers are being answered. When the reality is the Bible teaches us that for some people, their sins and iniquities stop God from hearing. That's not to say that David is in a sinful situation. It's not to say that he never has any struggles. But I think it's his experience that, Lord, do you hear me? And Lord, would you make haste? I need to know that you're listening. And would you answer my prayer speedily? In verse 2, he says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. That's kind of unique because some people believe that this psalm is being written in regards to David still under fire in a sense, hiding from King Saul who wants to bring him down. So for him to make this statement, perhaps he's reflecting about the time when he was in the tabernacle in the tents and how Incense uh, has an aroma. I don't know if anybody uh, burns incense. I know in the when I was in high school, which uh, I graduated in 1977, boy, uh, people that wanted to be cool, they burn incense. They got black lights, they got posters in their room, and it was kind of the thing, and it, it faded out. Now, uh, anytime I go into a shop that has incense, it always reminds me about that time. Well, incense are a reminder in Scripture for uh, the prayers of God's people. You can read from the Old Testament into the book of Revelation, and you will find that even the book of Revelation, John describes that the incense going up are reflective and reminding of the prayers of God's people. Now that's not to say that as Christians that I need to burn incense in front of me. That's up to you. We're not commanded to burn incense. But he's reflecting here. And he's talking about lifting up his hands. When, when you read the Bible, men are not given to uh, closing their eyes necessarily. You can. And why do we close our eyes when we pray? pray? Maybe perhaps to focus. But you find them opening up their eyes. You find them prostrate, laying before the Lord, or on their knees. And uh, the Bible teaches us to pray without ceasing. There's no specific posture the Bible teaches us that we need to pray. It's the attitude of prayer. There are times when we want God to listen to us more than others, and I believe that the times that we want Him to listen to us is probably in, in our, what I would call our 9 ones one situation, our trials, our moments of trials. And the psalmist, would you say he had his share of trials? Would you say from what we stubborn, studied in the Scripture that the psalmist David had a number of trials in his life. Just because we have accepted the Lord as Savior doesn't mean we don't have any trouble. But thank God the Lord has promised to be with us even in our trouble. If we've studied carefully David's life, you will learn that he had an authentic, genuine walk with God. Um, from a very young age, he was a, when he was a shepherd boy. And God took care of this man throughout all the days of his life, even as he reflects, I've been young, I've been old, and one thing for sure, uh, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. And I think it's in part to what he experienced about the goodness of God. And what we've been studying, he would go from been having anointed to actually being crowned king. And so the scripture reminds us of the many decisions he faced, and we see his brokenness. We see the immoral decisions that the king faced and his association with many other difficult things that he had to deal with the consequences. We see him crying out for the mercy of God on many occasions. And one thing we know about this man that we call the psalmist, David, was that he understood that he was a man of prayer. 
He talked to the Lord. He drew near to the Lord. Even a previous chapter that we looked at, Psalm 109, verse 4, despite of all the terrible things the enemy were about to do to him, in the midst of the opposition, he said, but I give myself unto prayer. So there's an urgency for God to listen to his petition. Secondly, we see an what we would say an unusual request for himself. Look at verse number three. He says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Set a watch. In other words, set a guard. He's asking God to help him as he has before regularly, but this time he's asking God to help him watch what? He says. Speaking from our own personal experience and looking at the Bible, we are simply people of clay. We have the capacity, we have the propensity within us to say things, to do things that may not be pleasing to God, including this man, the psalmist. And so as I read this passage in verse 3, he says, set a watch. And I don't know how you feel about this man, Psalmist, but when you read all of his life, then you get the full panoramic view of him. You understand that even though he believed in God, he still could sin. He could sin with his lips. He could sin with his eyes. He could sin with his heart. And his actions were the fruit of what was going on in his mind and his heart. Does it matter what we say? Yes, it does. And um, so this is an unusual request. Set a watch. Put a guard. And Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 36. Out of the, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. I believe this is true that when you come into a relationship with God, because the Holy Spirit now takes up residence, the Apostle Paul mentioned this in Romans 8, that if any man is going to be in Christ, he's a, he is going to be a recipient of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, apart from the Holy Spirit of God, we may be religious, but once the Holy Spirit takes up residence, now you are the temple of the Spirit of God living inside of you. And there, I would say, be a change even to the very words we share and speak. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, referring to someone's life that's changed at salvation, Paul said this, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good through the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sakes, hath forgiven you. I believe there are many people tonight that speak words that they are ashamed of in part because of maybe bottled up anger. Maybe because of the abuse trauma that they went through. And so they're upset. And those closest around them sometimes get uh, are the recipients of those words. It may be vulgar language and with the internet and with all the the movies and Hollywood, what Hollywood's produced, uh, X is the norm for some people. Rated X, the vulgar language. Just walk in a parking lot in um, uh, stores in the country, you'll hear things, it won't take long. People cursing and swearing in a very regular basis. And people say stuff like that, using God's name, GD, and to try to act tough. Uh, this is nothing new. People lie, people curse and swear, people cut down. But God's word says, let no corrupt communication 
proceed out of your mouth. You say, what if I, what if I say something that's unkind, untruthful? Well, we're told that we have a Heavenly Father that still loves us, amen, and that we can confess our sins to Him. He's faithful and just to forgive, to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I remember in uh, elementary, uh, this really happened. Um, uh, the teacher um, asked for homework from us students, and I had told him I did my homework, but the reality is, was... When he asked for the paper, I didn't have anything to turn in. You see, what did he do? He led me to the back of the classroom, and I had to have my mouth washed with soap. Today, that would probably not be called for. But I did. It happened back then. And, and, and the ideal was, don't lie, don't, don't say things that aren't truthful. And that was not the only time I got in trouble. One time I ended up in the principal's office and that's another story so the psalmist is asking set a watch O lord before my mouth keep the door of my lips back in psalm 19 verse 14 the psalmist said let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O lord my strength and my redeemer sometimes it's not kind it's not the kind of words whether it's whether they are heard and understood um Heard about the man that goes to the doctor. He's concerned about his wife's hearing. The doctor says to this man, stand behind her and say something and tell her how close you are when she hears you. And the man goes home and sees his wife in the kitchen cutting carrots on the countertop about 20 feet away. He says, honey, what's for dinner? Nothing. He gets about 10 feet closer to her and repeats the same question. Nothing. Very concerned, he gets right behind her and asks again, what's for dinner? She turns around and says, for the third time, beef stew. Who had trouble listening, right? So, you ever find yourself, Lord, help me not to say something I shouldn't say. Or, after you blow it, finding yourself having to humble yourself, which I think is can be a very common thing, being transparent, clearing up the ear for saying, asking for someone forgiveness. So a lot of preventive maintenance, if you please, spiritual preventive maintenance goes with this prayer that Psalmist says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Verse 4, incline my heart to, incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity and let me not eat of their dainties. So the, the phrase here, the statement has given us this idea that the psalmist David didn't want to be like the enemies that were opposing him, calling him wicked and vile things, abusing him emotionally, but he came close. He, he's on the verge and I would say, you know, a lot of people have different ideas. If you can't beat them, join them. I would say that would be wrong uh, in his case. But understanding that you have the nature that could very well share things uh, and not be the right kind of testimony. Number three, and I'm going to just shorten this, but we not only see his... Uh, Unusual requests for himself, and we find this uh, urgency for God to hear his petition, but thoroughly unexpected kindness. Oh, look at verse 5. Maybe this is how God is going to answer your prayer and my prayer. What do we mean? Look at verse 5. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent Oil which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Now what is this verse re referring to? Now, this is one of those truths that comes out that is not brought out a whole bunch of times in the Old T Testament, as well as it's brought out in the New Testament. This is the idea of rebuke. This is the idea of reprove. 
if someone really cares about you or you care about someone, you will hope and you will pray that someone will speak the truth to you and it may involve exhortation to the point that they try to correct you. Now, my wife is here tonight and she can vouch for this, but if I ever say anything wrong in a message or in a teaching of the Word of God, she doesn't, she doesn't flinch. She'll let me know. She'll share it to me. Not to put me down, but to help me. And I've learned this. Someone shares something about me, a good to go by would be this. And especially if you share some, something, is, is it truthful about what I'm going to say? Or you could ask the individual, can I quote you what you're saying to me? And usually if they say no, then probably they shouldn't be sharing what they're telling you. And I found this help. I, I learned this in college. This is one of those tidbits that I practiced because I was working in bus ministry back then. And we had a lot of, a lot of circumstances come up. Is what I'm about to say to that child or teenager or mom and dad, is it helpful or is it hurtful? If you get a delight off of sharing someone to the point that they're hurting, it's probably not God honoring. So, can I tell you, if you truly are praying this prayer that the psalmist is praying, that the Lord, God help me, watch what I say, don't let my heart uh, be attached to any of the wicked things that people that are out there, God may answer that prayer by bringing someone into your life and mind to correct us or warn us or even rebuke us. He mentions that it's kindness. Let the righteous smite me. Let it shall be kindness and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil. During the days of the psalmist, if you traveled uh, in a journey, uh, they oftentimes would anoint one another with oil. And if I went up to you tonight and just started rubbing oil on your head, probably get offended, okay? You probably say, hey, what's going on, Byron? Uh, you know, are you one of those charismatic preachers that annoys people all over the place and starts praying for them? But back in their day, if you journey, the oil was a sense of blessing. Uh, they didn't have all the aerosol sprays, you know? And so the oil was, would bring fragrance, nice aroma. So this is the idea that if, if someone speaks to me, and, and I've had to tell my wife when she has made the statements to correct me, thank you for sharing it with that because I need to edit that. Because we take the messages from here and we put them on our church website and we put them on other media. And maybe you're doing a job and, and you know, you think you got it all together and someone comes along and says, I think you need to do this instead. We should be teachable. So the psalmist here is saying this is kindness that has come his way. And as I look at his life, he was blessed in so, so many ways. The rest of the psalm, in verse 6, it says, When their judges are overthrown in stony places, then shall they hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth, as one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. Not sure what that means. But my eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord, in thee my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me, and the gins, that will be the strategies of the workers of iniquity. Now let the wicked fall into their own nests, lest that I withal escape. In closing, I believe this is a wonderful, life-changing prayer to God. He not only makes reference of what may come out of his mouth, but that God would help him not incline to any evil thing from his heart. Watching what you say is greatly help, beginning with your prayer life, who you pray to. If it's the creator God of the Bible, we know that God listens. There's nothing too hard for God to do. We know God is very interested in every area of our life. He sees it all. 
And so he sent forth his only son, the dear Lord Jesus, as a savior. So basically he could save ourselves from ourselves in one sense. We know ultimately Jesus died on the cross to save us from the wrath of God, being separated from God in the lake of fire. But in everyday life, in everyday experiences, we may be tempted to say something, to do something that later on we might regret. So let's pray the prayer and let's trust God to help us. God knows what we're dealing with and some situations are, are a lot more difficult than others. When people say things to you, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I have. I can only speak out. When someone said something unkind to me and I came back with an unkind comeback, it felt good saying that. Did you know there's pleasure in sin? But for a season, for a little while. And then it's, it's payday. So when you're tempted to come back, maybe, maybe you need to just keep silent. Maybe you need to think twice and let God control you in that area for the moment and let him have his way. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this psalm and reminding us the importance about what we say, what we do, what we think. Lord, forgive us when we fail you and we ask that you give us the humility like the psalmist to be able to talk to you about what we should say. Lord, there's a lot of temptations around us of all sorts. Grant us wisdom and discernment. And I would pray for the Holy Spirit to continue to help us make right decisions that are honorable to you. And we'll give you thanks for that. Save that one that is yet to receive you as Savior. And we'll praise you for what you do. We ask this all in your precious name. And all God's people can say, Amen and Amen.